Welcome, dear listener, to the second episode of The Passenger, the channel that aims to bring you first-hand accounts from past travelers. The following episode took shape from Ibn Fadlan's journey to the land of darkness. In the 10th century CE, the hero of this voyage, Ibn Fadlan, was sent from Baghdad by the Caliph on a diplomatic mission heading north to the king of the Volga Bulgars in today's city of Kazan, Russia. On its way, he faces harsh environments and unfamiliar cultures, which culminates in the only written source we have of a Viking funeral. And isn't it marvelous that it is written in Arabic? But in order to better understand the essence of this time and space we are dealing with, which is a quite obscure one in mainstream history, we decided to craft around the main travelogue a few more stories, so that you, listener, can have a full grasp of the account. That being said, today's episode comprises three stories. The first story is taken from the 1001 Nights, or Arabian Nights, a collection of precious folk tales that gifted us with Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, Sinbad the Sailor and Aladdin. Some of the stories have roots in ancient Indian and Egyptian cultures, but its written collection was preserved in an Arabic compilation from the 9th century CE. Because it is our belief that a story told again and again absorbs a sort of wisdom that makes it meaningful enough to keep circulating up to this day, we want to start this episode with a quite grim one. Then the tale shall be interrupted by the exploration of the historical context from where it emerged. We'll have a bird's eye view of the often called Islamic Golden Age, as well as of the people with whom they have contact. Only then we enter the zone, the core of this episode, with Ibn Fadlan's journey right into the land of darkness, where the dreadful mythological tribes of Gog and Magog cast a shadow over the civilized world. Let's just put it this way, once upon a time, a Muslim, a Viking and a Turkic nomad walked into a bar, arriving by camel, dragon ship and horse. After the account, we shall return to the historical contextualization to understand why this diplomatic mission represents the end of an era, and finally return to the tale of the Arabian Nights. Those familiar with the subject already realize that the structure of this episode is a blueprint from the plots of the Arabian Nights themselves, which we could describe as a Russian doll pattern of storytelling. A story inside a story inside a story inside a story. Among the histories of past peoples, a story is told that in the old days, in the islands of India and China, there was a Sasanian king named Shariar, and one day he decided to visit his younger brother, the king of Samarkand. He comes out of his residency, intending to leave for his brother's country. But at midnight, he thought of something that he had forgotten and went back to the palace. When he entered his room, he was to discover his wife in bed with a black slave. The world turned dark for him. He drew his sword and struck, killing both his wife and her lover as they lay together. From now on, every night, the King Shariar would take a virgin, deflower her and then kill her. This led to unrest among the citizens. They fled away with their daughters until there were no nubile girls left in the city. Then, when the vizier was ordered to bring the king a girl, as usual, he searched but could not find a single one, and had to go home empty-handed, dejected, 
and afraid of what the king might do to him. The vizier himself had two daughters, of whom the elder was called Sharazad and the younger Dunyazad. Sharazad had read books and histories, having collected, it was said, a thousand volumes of these, covering peoples, kings and poets. She asked her father what had happened to make him so careworn and sad. Her father told her all that had happened between him and the king from beginning to end, at which she said, Father, marry me to this man. By God, he exclaimed, you are not to risk your life. She insisted that it had to be done, so he decked her out and took her to the king Shariar. She had given instructions to her younger sister Dunyazad, explaining, When I go to the king, I shall call you. You must come, and when you see that the king has done what he wants with me, you have to say, Tell me a story, sister, so as to pass the waking part of the night. I shall then tell you a tale. God willing, will save us. Sharazad was now taken by her father to the king, who was pleased to see him, and said, Have you brought what I want? When the vizier said yes, the king was about to lie with Sharazad, but she shed tears, and when he asked her what was wrong, she told him, I have a young sister, and I want to say goodbye to her. At that, the king called Dunyazad, and when she had embraced Sharazad, she, Dunyazad, took the seat beneath the bed, while the king got up and deflowered her sister Sharazad. They then sat talking, and Dunyazad asked Sharazad to tell a story to pass the waking hours of the night. Sharazad replied, With great pleasure, if our cultured king gives me permission. The king was restless, and when he heard what the sisters had to say, he was glad at the thought of listening to a story, and so he gave his permission to Sharazad. And Sharazad started to tell a story. It is said, king of the age and lord of our times, that one night the caliph, Harun al-Rashid, summoned his vizier Jafar and said, I want to go down into the city to ask the common people about the governors who have charge of them, so as to depose any of whom they complain and promote those to whom they are grateful. The vizier Jafar replied, To hear is to obey. So the caliph, Jafar, and Masrud left the palace and made their way through the city, walking in the markets and streets until they passed the lane. There they saw a very old man carrying on his head a fishing net, a basket, and holding a stick in his hand. He was walking slowly and reciting, the poor, their state, their life. How dark they are with troubles! In summer they cannot find food, and in the cold they have to warm themselves over a brazier. Such is the life of the poor man. It will be best for him when he is in his grave. When the caliph heard what the man was reciting, he said to Jafar, Look at this man and note his verses, which show that he is in need. The caliph then went up to the man and said, Shaikh, what is your craft? I am a fisherman, he replied. I left home at midday, but up till now God has not provided me with anything with which I can feed my family. I am tired of life, and I wish that I were dead. The caliph replied, Would you go back with us to the Tigris River, stand on the bank, and trust in my luck as you cast your net? Whatever comes up, I'll buy for a hundred dinars. When the old fisherman heard this, he agreed with delight. He went with the three of them back to the river, cast his net and waited. Up it came with a heavy, locked chest. The caliph looked at the chest, handled it and noted its weight, after which he gave the fisherman his hundred dinars and the man went off. The caliph himself then left, 
accompanied by Masrur, who was carrying the chest, and they brought it up to the palace. Candles were lit, and after the chest has been placed in front of the caliph, Jafar and Masrur came forward and broke it open. In it, they found a carpet. Wrapped in this was a girl who had been killed and cut to pieces, a sight that so distressed the caliph that his tears flowed over his cheeks. He turned to Jafar and said, Dog of a vizier, are people to be murdered and thrown into the river during my reign so that I am to be held responsible for them on the day of judgment? By God, I must make the murderer pay for this girl's death and I shall put him to the most cruel of deaths. It is as true as is my descent from the Abbasid Caliphs that if you, Jafar, do not produce the murderer for my justice, I will hang you at the palace gate together with forty of your cousins. Jafar went down sadly into the city, saying to himself, How can I find out who killed this girl and bring him to the Caliph? If I bring the wrong person, I shall be held responsible for him. I don't know what to do. When after three days he came to the caliph and was asked where the murderer was, he said, Commander of the faithful, am I the monitor of murder victims that I should know who killed the girl? The caliph was enraged and gave orders that he should be hanged below the palace. A town crier was ordered to call out in the streets of Baghdad. Whoever wants to see the hanging of Jafar the Barmecide, the Caliph's vizier, and the hanging of his Barmecide cousins at the palace gate, let him come to watch. People came out from all quarters of the city to see the execution, although they did not know why the Barmecides were being hanged. The gallows were set up and the victims were made to stand beneath. The executioners were waiting for the agreed signal from the caliph, and the crowd was weeping for Jafar and his cousins. At this point, however, a young man, handsome and well-dressed, cleared his way through the people and said, The killer of the murdered girl, whom you found in the chest, is I. So hang me in retaliation for her death and take revenge for her on me. Filled with wonder, the caliph asked the young man, Why was it that you unjustly killed this girl? It's the narrator here. As you noticed, this last tale is clearly binded to a particular time and place. In the 9th century city of Baghdad, during the reign of the Abbasid caliph Harun al-Rashid. The scholar Joseph Wilson distinguishes this era by the following traits, quote, The Abbasids ushered a flourishing period of intellectual output and economic prosperity. The Caliph al-Mansur founded the city of peace, Baghdad, as the new capital of the Caliphate. Harun al-Rashid ruled over an era marked by classic literature and extravagant diplomacy with Western powers. His was the age of the Thousand and One Nights, the prolific non-fiction writer Al-Jahez, and gift exchange with the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne." Unquote. It might seem surprising to us that the political leader of Islam and the political leader of Western Christendom engaged in gift exchange and mutual admiration. Al-Rashid created conditions for Christian pilgrims to safely visit Christ's tomb in Jerusalem, which was under his domain. The medieval scholar named Einhard, who wrote down the biography of Charlemagne, mentions the following on the extravagant diplomacy. Quote, A few years earlier, Harun al-Rashid had sent Charlemagne the only elephant he possessed, simply because the Frankish king asked for it. Unquote. The early Middle Ages Benedictine monk of St. Gall, Notger the Stammerer, describes the gift exchange as follows, quote, These same Persian envoys brought the emperor an elephant, some monkeys, balsam, nard, 
unguents of various sorts, spices, scents and a wide variety of medicaments. They seem to have despoiled the East so that they might offer all these gifts to the West." Unquote. It's quite comical that a political leader at the time would offer an elephant and imagine the respect Charlemagne got in Europe by showing up in the battlefield with one. But here is where we should get to. These accounts sound quite pitiful when they proclaim that the caliph offered the only elephant he had, or that the East got the spoiled by the many gifts to the West. Could they even conceive at what political, commercial and cultural level the caliph al-Rashid was playing? Let's get the numbers right. At this time, Baghdad was a city with a population over one million inhabitants, while the biggest cities in Western Christendom were Rome, with 50,000, and Paris, with 25,000. London would have around 10,000 inhabitants. In the introduction to Ibn Fadlan's account, published by Penguin Classics, we can find the following description of the city. Quote, Baghdad was the capital of the Abbasid Empire and the largest and richest city west of China, rivaled in wealth and size only by Córdoba, the capital of Muslim Spain. As a multicultural and multilingual imperial capital, Baghdad was a clearinghouse for geographic, commercial and political information. News brought by merchants of the opening up of far northern lands to commercial exploitation, along with information about other distant trading partners, such as India, China and the Indonesian archipelago, filtered into the works of the geographers, historians and scholars working in Baghdad." Unquote. A few moments ago we mentioned Jafar, and yes, this Jafar is also the fictional character in Aladdin. The historical Jafar was part of the Barmakids, a Buddhist family from North Afghanistan. It is attributed to them the role of bringing the first paper mill to Baghdad during the reign of al-Rashid. Here is how Jonathan Bloom, in his book Paper Before Print, describes the role of this new medium in the Islamic and later European societies. Quote, the introduction of paper in the 8th century had a transformative effect on medieval Islamic civilization, spurring an extraordinary burst of literary creativity in virtually all subjects, from theology to natural sciences. New types of literature, such as cookbooks and the amusing tales we now know as the Thousand and One Nights, were copied on paper for sale to interested readers. Scholars and copyists translated Greek rolls and manuscripts written on parchment and papyrus into Arabic and transcribed them onto sheets of paper, which were then bound into books. Paper may have been invented in China, but if Muslims had not brought papermaking to Spain, Europeans would not have learned about it before the 17th century. If Gutenberg had been forced to print his books only on parchment, they would have been almost as expensive as the handwritten manuscripts they were meant to replace, and it would have taken much longer for Europeans to realize the benefits of printing." Unquote. We now have a hint on how the introduction of paper as a cheap writing material stimulated thought. But what kind of thinking are we talking about? Let's have a quick look. The following paragraph belongs to the 9th century Arab polymath Al-Kindi, considered to be the father of Arabic philosophy. Quote, we must not be ashamed to admire the truth or to acquire it from wherever it comes, even if it should come from far-flung nations and foreign peoples. That is for the student of truth nothing more important than the truth, nor is the truth demeaned or diminished by the one who states or conveys it. No one is demeaned by the truth. Rather, all are ennobled by it. Had it not been for previous philosophers, we would never, not even with intense enquiry over the course of all our lives, have collected these true principles, by means of which we proceed to the ultimate aims of our study into what is hidden." Al-Kindi was deeply involved in the translation movement, an impressive effort from Arab 
and non-Arab scholars living in the caliphate to translate Greek texts into Arabic. So much so, that there are even stories of a caliph having a dream with Aristotle, where the latest uncovers the principles through which he should govern his people. Much of the ancient Greek knowledge that would kickstart the Renaissance in Europe originates from this translation movement. It's always interesting to find these things out, because we tend to look at history in a fragmented way, as if there was no contact between the parts, as if everything was conflict and religious rivalries. Yet, a pope like Sylvester II, in touch with Moors from Muslim Spain, had no prejudice in introducing and encouraging the use of Islamic numerals in Europe. The Lebanese-British historian Albert Hurani writes that, for the first time in history, science became international on a large scale. But before we move forward, let's just connect all these thoughts in one paragraph written by E. H. Combridge in his enchanting book A Little History of the World. This book, that I can't recommend enough, was written for young readers. But the wisdom in the simplicity achieved can be appreciated by everyone. Quote, the Arabs began to collect and read books. They particularly liked the writings of Alexander the Great's famous tutor, Aristotle, and translated them into Arabic. From him, they learned to concern themselves with everything in nature and to investigate the origins of all things. The names of many of the sciences you learn about at school come from Arabic, names like chemistry and algebra. The book you have in your hand is made of paper, something we also owe to the Arabs, who themselves learned how to make it from the Chinese. There are two things for which I am specially grateful to the Arabs. First, the wonderful tales they used to tell and then wrote down, which you can read in the Thousand and One Nights. The second is even more fabulous than the tales, although you may not think so. Listen, here is a number. Twelve. Now why do you think we say 12 rather than 1, 2 or 1 and 2? Because, you say, the 1 isn't really a 1 at all, but a 10. Do you know how the Romans wrote 12? Like this. And 112. And 1112. Just think of trying to multiply and add up with Roman numbers like these. Whereas with our Arabic numbers, it's easy. Not just because they are attractive and easy to write, but because they contain something new. Place value. The value given to a number on account of its position. A number placed on the left of two others has to be a hundred number. So we write 100 with a 1 followed by two zeros. Could you have come up with such a useful invention? I certainly couldn't. We owe it to the Arabs, who themselves owe it to the Indians. And in my opinion, that invention is even more amazing than all the Thousand and One Nights put together. Perhaps it's just as well that Charles Martel defeated the Arabs in 732. And yet, it was not such a bad thing that they founded their great empire, because it was through those conquests that the ideas and discoveries of the Persians, Greeks, Indians and even Chinese were all brought together." Unquote. However, let's now speak about the world up north, which is after all the destination of Ibn Fadlan, the hero of our story. Was Europe, for example, living apart blind in its dark ages. Hmm, maybe not as much as we thought. When visiting a market in the 10th century city of Mainz, Germany, a Jewish merchant from Muslim Spain was surprised with what he found. Quote, it is extraordinary that one should be able to find in such far western regions aromatics and spices that only grow in the far east like pepper, ginger, cloves, nard, custos, and galingale. These plants are all imported from India, where they grow in abundance." Unquote. The same author goes on to describe Prague. Quote, the city of Prague is built of stone and lime, 
It is the principal trading city. The Rus and the Slavs go there from Krakow to trade, and so do Muslim merchants from the lands of the Turks, for they carry away slaves, tin, and various kinds of furs." Unquote. So now that we explored the surprising interconnectedness of Ibn Fadlan's world, the encounter between Arabs and Vikings does not seem so unexpected anymore. Actually, this previous Jewish merchant mentioned them already. The Rus. Who are they? The Rus are Swedish Vikings, trading and enslaving along the eastern river routes from the Baltic to the Black and Caspian Seas. Through the Dnieper River in today's Ukraine, they contacted with the Byzantine Empire down the Black Sea and through the Volga River, at the gates of Siberia, they would meet with Muslim merchants down the Caspian Sea. They can be called the Silver Seekers from the North. At this point, I should introduce an idea that I saw for the first time in Timothy Snyder's lectures on Ukraine in the YouTube channel Yale Courses. This idea was presented as the dynamics of slave trade. In short, if you belong to a pagan tribe, you are up for grabs, to be taken away and sold in the slave market. Without getting into judgments of value, this works fine until more and more tribes start converting to monotheistic religions. If you are a Christian or a Muslim ruler, you cannot enslave fellow Christians or fellow Muslims. You can forbid them to leave the land, but by the norm, they cannot be taken away and sold in the market. Consequently, the math of slave trade turns against the pagans because there are more of them converting and less of them remaining. The converted pagans adopt a civilization package which comes with writing, a system of law, political recognition and alliances. So here is when we enter Ibn Fadlan's journey north into the land of darkness. In the beginning of the 10th century, a king named Almish from the Volga Bulgars was having some friction with the Khazars. We could probably say that the math of the slave dynamic was being disadvantageous for the king Almish. The Volga Bulgars were a semi-nomadic Turkic-speaking tribe in today's Russian city of Kazan, capital of the Republic of Tatarstan. The Khazars who were threatening the Volga Bulgars, were also a semi-nomadic Turkish polity located in modern southwest Russia and the Caucasus. The Khazars elite, which at some point converted to Judaism, that's how confusing this gets, were a quite dominant force at the time, so the King Almish of the Volga Bulgars was looking for a religion he and his people could convert to, and he thought he had found an ally in the Abbasid Caliph al-Muqtadir. From the Caliph, Almish requested an embassy that would instruct the Volga Bulgars in the ways of Islam, build a mosque and sponsor a new fortification as a sign of commitment to the alliance. Ibn Fadlan was the spokesperson of this embassy, whose caravan, or desert travelers, went all the way north to the Volga Bulgars in order to materialize the alliance. However, the person responsible for bringing the money requested by Almish for the fortification is joining the crew only later on. Will the money arrive on time? Will Almish, the king of the Volga Bulgars, ask Ibn Fadlan for it? Let's start this diplomatic mission and give Ibn Fadlan his word. Quote, When the letter arrives from Almish, king of the Volga Bulgars, addressed to Muqtadir, the commander of the faithful, in which he asked for someone who could instruct him in the faith, teach him the laws of Islam, build him a mosque and a fortress for defense against the kings who were his adversaries, a favorable answer was given. I, Ibn Fadlan, was given the responsibility for reading the letter to the Bulgar king, making over to him the gifts that had been sent and supervising the teachers and jurists. 
a sum of money was assigned, which was to be delivered to the Bulgar king to carry out the construction work. We set out from the city of peace, Baghdad, on Friday, 21st of June, 921. We entered Bukhara and requested an audience with the Amir of Khurasan. He was read the letter ordering him not to hinder our mission and send the letter to the gate of the Turk, ordering not to place any difficulties in our path. The Amir then asked, Where is Ahmad ibn Musa? Hey, it's the narrator here. Ahmad ibn Musa was responsible for bringing the money that would close the alliance between the Caliph and Almish, the king of the Volga Bulgars. And ibn Fadlan's crew was now in Bukhara, waiting for him. We told the Amir. We left him in Baghdad. He was supposed to set out five days after us. He replied, I hear and I obey the order of our Lord, commander of the faithful. May God prolong his existence. We stayed at Bukhara for 28 days. When I had heard the words of Ibn Bashtu and others warning me against the approach of winter, we left Bukhara to head back to the river and hired a boat to take us to Khwarazm. When Ahmad ibn Musa gets here, he can catch up with us. We went at once to the ruler of the town, the Khwarazm Shah, he showed us honor, admitted us to his presence, and lodged us in a house. After three days, he summoned us to discuss the question of visiting the land of the Turks. He said to us, I will not give you permission to go, for it is not licit for me to allow you to risk your lives. But in the country of which you speak, and where you are now, there are a thousand tribes of unbelievers. The Caliph has been misled in all this. Later, we went back and kept trying to get into his good graces, flattering him, saying, Here are the orders of the commander of the faithful and his letter. Why refer to him again on this subject? Finally, he gave us permission to continue on our journey. The Oxus River freezes. It froze for its entire length, and the ice was seventeen spans thick. Thirty horses, mules, donkeys and carts slid over the ice as if on roads, and the ice was solid and did not crack. The river remained like this for three months. We saw a land which made us think a gate to the cold of hell had opened before us. When snow falls, it is always accompanied by a rough and violent wind. Our stay in Yuryania, in today's border between Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, was extended for nearly three months. The cold and the hardships it causes were the reasons for the length of our stay. I was told, in fact, that two men set out with twelve camels to load wood in the forest, but they forgot to take flint and tinder with them. They had to spend the night without a fire, and in the morning their camels were dead from the terrible cold. I saw how the intense cold made itself felt in this country. The roads and markets were so empty that one could wander through most of them without seeing a soul or coming face to face with another living being. On returning to the house, I looked at my beard. It was a block of ice, which I had to defrost in front of the fire. When we were in the middle of the month of February, 922, the weather began to change and the ice on the river melted. We then set about obtaining what we needed for the journey. We bought Turkish camels and had boats made out of camel skin to allow us to pass the rivers we needed to cross in the land of the Turks. 
when the day came for us to set out, I said to the caravan, you are carrying letters from the caliph and I'm quite sure that they mention the 4,000 Musayabi dinars that are intended for him. You are going to a foreign king. He will demand his money. Don't worry about that, they said to me. He won't ask for it. I warned them and said, I know that he will demand it, but they would not listen. We put our trust in God, mighty and powerful, and placed our faith in his hands. We set out on Monday, the 4th of March, 922. We entered the land of the Turks, marching on across this flat, desert-like steppe without ever turning aside from the road. After having marched for 15 nights, we reached a great mountain, very rocky, through which streams fought their way, filling depressions with water and forming pools. When we had crossed that mountain, we came to a tribe of Turks called Ogas. They were nomads who live in felt tents and come and go. You see their tents, first in one place, then in another, as is the way of nomads. They live in poverty, like wandering asses. When an unknown man comes to a Turk and says to him, I'm your guest and I want your camels and horse and dirhams, he gives him what he wants. If the merchant dies on the journey he has undertaken, the Turk goes to the people in the caravan when it returns and says to them, Where is your guest? If they say, he died, the Turk goes to the most important merchant he sees among them, opens his packs of merchandise while the merchant looks on, and takes exactly the money that is owing to him and nothing more. Similarly, he takes several of his camels and horses and says to him, he was your cousin and you are the most appropriate person to pay his debts. If the man has fled, the Turk does the same thing, going to the merchant and saying, he was a Muslim, like you, take responsibility for him. They do not wash after polluting themselves with excrement and urine, and have no contact with water, especially in winter. It is their custom never to take off a piece of clothing they are wearing until it falls to pieces. Their women do not veil themselves before their own men or strangers. Similarly, the women do not hide any parts of their body. One day, we went to the home of one of them and sat down. This man's wife was with us. As we were talking, she bared her private parts and scratched while we stared at her. We covered our faces with our hands and said, I seek forgiveness from God. Her husband began to laugh and addressing the interpreter said, Tell them this. She uncovers her private parts in your presence, and you see them, but she protects them and allows no one near, better than covering them up and letting you get at them. If a man dies, they bring his horses, no matter how numerous they may be, even a hundred or two hundred, and kill them, down to the very last one, and eat their flesh. They then hang the head, hooves, hide and tail over the wooden stakes and say, these are the horses he will ride to paradise. One day, a military chief of the Turks said in our presence, This is something we have never either seen or heard of. Never in our whole lives, nor in the lifetimes of our fathers, has an envoy of the Caliph come to us. I can only think this is some trick of the Caliph and that he has sent these people to the Hazars to tell them to gather an army against us. The thing to do is to have each of these envoys cut in two and take everything they have with them. They continued to argue among themselves for seven days, during which time we were at death's door, until the day they agreed to let us continue on our way and leave. When we were a day and night's journey from the king of the Volga Bulgars, 
for it was to him that we were heading, he sent out to welcome us the four kings who were under his authority, accompanied by his brothers and sons. We arrived on Sunday, 12th of May, 922. On Thursday, we unfurled the two banners that we had with us, saddled the horse with the saddle which had been sent to the king as a present, and dressed the king in black robes and a turban. Then I got out the caliph's letter and said that it was not permitted to remain seated during the reading of the letter. The king rose and the principal man of his kingdom who were present did likewise. The king was a very fat man with a large belly. I started to read the first part of the letter. The interpreter continued to translate the letter for us, word for word, and when we had finished reading, they pronounced Allah Akbar so loudly that the earth shook. Three days after the reading of the letter and distribution of presents, the king sent for me. On my entering, he invited me to sit down. I did so, and he threw me the letter of the commander of the faithful. Who brought this letter? he asked. I did, I replied. And what happened to the money mentioned in those letters? I answered. It was impossible to collect it. There was not enough time, and for fear of missing the season for reaching your country, we left it to be brought later. You all came together, and my master, the caliph, paid all your expenses, and the only reason was so that you could bring me this money to have a fortress built to protect me from the Jews, who have tried to reduce me to slavery. That is quite true, I said, but we did what we could. Then the king said to the interpreter, Tell him that I do not recognize these people. I only recognize you, Ibn Fadlan. I shall not demand one single dirham from anyone else but you. Hand over the money, it will be better for you. I left him and went out in consternation and much saddened. He was a good-looking man, stout and full-bodied, who inspired respect. He was like a great barrel speaking. I left his presence, gathered together my companions and told them what happened between the king and myself. I told them. I warned you about this. One day, the king's muezzin, hey, the Muslim official who proclaims the call to prayer, repeated the phrases of the ikama twice when he gave the call to prayer. I said to him, in his dominions, your master, the commander of the faithful, only has them said once. Then the king told the muezzin, accept what he tells you and don't contradict him. For several days, the muezzin observed the rule. Meanwhile, the king asked me questions about the money and argued with me about it. When he realized that he was not going to get the better of me, he ordered the muezzin to repeat the phrases of the ikama twice. The muezzin obeyed, for the king wanted to use this as a way of starting up a discussion again. When I heard the repetition of the phrases, I ordered the muezzin to stop doing it and shouted at him. The king heard about this and summoned me to appear before him with my companions. When we had all assembled, he said to the interpreter, Ask him, meaning me, What would you say of a man who gave to others money intended for poor people, people who were suffering a blockade and reduced to servitude, and then was cheated out of that money? It is not permitted, I said and such people would be evildoers. Unanimously agreed, or with differences in opinion? Unanimously, I answered. Then he said to the interpreter, Say to him, Do you think that if the caliph, may God prolong his days, sent an army against me, he could prevail over me? No, I said. Or over the Amir of Khurasan, he continued. No. Is that not because of the great distance that separates us and the number of infidel tribes between his lands and mine? Clearly, I said. Then he said to the interpreter, Tell him this. By God, although I live in a remote place, as you see, I still fear my master, the commander of the faithful. 
I fear that he will learn something about me that will displease him, that he will call down God's wrath upon me and destroy my country without even leaving his kingdom, despite the great distance between us. But you? You eat his bread, you wear his clothes, you see him every hour of the day, and yet you have betrayed him on the mission upon which he sent you to me, to a weak people. And you have betrayed the Muslims. I shall accept no admonishments from you in matters of religion until someone comes to me who speaks with a sincere tongue. When such a man comes to me, I will accept what he says. We were at a loss of words. There was nothing we could answer, so we left his presence. The issue is the following. The son of the king of the Bulgars is a hostage to the king of the Hazars. The king of the Bulgars, fearing the king of the Hazars, wrote to the caliph and asked him to build a fortress. In his country, I saw uncounted marvels. The first night that we spent in this land, a full hour before sunset, I saw the horizon turn a brilliant shade of red, and in the upper air there was great noise and tumult. I raised my head and saw a red mist like fire close to me. Then, suddenly, another bank of mist appeared, just like the first, in which I saw men and horses. Frightened, we began to pray and beseech God most humbly, while the locals laughed at us and were astonished at our behavior. In the red sky, we watched the two armies charging. They clashed for a moment and then parted, and so it continued for an hour after nightfall. Then they vanished. We questioned the king on this subject. He claimed that his ancestors said, They are the believing and the unbelieving jinn. They fight every night and have not failed to do so every night since they were first created. A more scientific explanation for this phenomena might be the witnessing of a red aurora borealis. I observed that in their lands the days are very long and remain so for a certain part of the year and the nights are short. Then the nights lengthen and the days shorten. The king told me that beyond his country, three months march away, there is a people called Ves, among whom the night lasts less than an hour. If they see a man whose mind is lively and who knows many things, they say, This man deserves to serve our Lord. And they take him and put a rope round his neck and hang him in a tree until he falls to pieces. The king's interpreter told me that a man from Sindh had come to this country by chance and remained for a time in the service of the king. He was skillful and intelligent. A number of people from that country wanted to set out for reasons of trade. The man from Sindh asked the king for permission to live with them, but the king forbade him to go. The man insisted so much that he gave him permission to go and he set off with them in a boat. The people saw that he was quick-witted and intelligent, and they discussed it among themselves and said, This man is fitting for the service of our Lord so let's send him. As their route took them near a forest, they took him there, placed a rope about his neck and hung him from the top of a tall tree. Then they left him there and went away. Men and women go down to the river together to wash, completely naked, no one hiding their body from anyone else. Under no circumstances do they fornicate. If somebody, no matter who it is, commits adultery. They set out four iron stakes, attach the guilty person by their hands and feet, and cut them in two from the nape of the neck to the tights with an axe. They do the same to the woman. Then they hang the pieces of both bodies from a tree. I also saw the Rus, who had come for trade and had camped by the river. On this river, is the site of a great market which is held frequently and where all kinds of precious merchandise is to be had. 
I have never seen bodies more perfect than theirs. They were like palm trees. They are fair and ruddy. They wear neither coats nor kaftans, but a garment which covers one side of the body and leaves one hand free. Each of them carries an axe, a sword, and a knife, and is never parted from any of the arms we have mentioned. From the tips of his toes to his neck, each man is tattooed in dark green with designs and so forth. They are the filthiest of God's creatures. They do not clean themselves after urinating or defecating, nor do they wash after having sex. They do not wash their hands after meals, they are like wandering asses. When they arrive from their land, they anchor their boat on the Itil, which is a great river, and they build large wooden houses on the banks. Ten or twelve people more or less live together in one of these houses. With them, there are beautiful slave girls for sale to merchants. Each of the men has sex with his slave, while his companions look on. Sometimes a whole group of them gather together in this way, in full view of one another. If a merchant enters at this moment to buy a young slave girl from one of the men, and finds him having sex with her, the man does not get up of her until he has satisfied himself. Every day, without fail, they wash their faces and their heads with the dirtiest and filthiest water there could be. A young serving girl comes every morning with breakfast, and with it a great basin of water. She proffers it to her master, who washes his hands and face in it. He washes and disentangles his hair using a comb. Then he blows his nose and spits and does every filthy thing imaginable in the water. When he has finished, the servant carries the bowl to the man next to him. She goes on passing the basin round from one to another until she has taken it to all the men in the house in turn. And each of them blows his nose and spits and washes his face and hair in this basin. When a great man dies, the member of his family say to his slave girls and young slave boys, Which of you will die with him? One of them replies, I will. Once they have spoken, it is irreversible and there is no turning back. If they wanted to change their mind, they would not be allowed to. Usually, it is the slave girls who offer to die. Then they appointed two young slave girls to watch over her and follow her everywhere she went, sometimes even washing her feet with their own hands. The slave girl spends each day drinking and singing happily and joyfully. When the day came that the man was to be burned and the girl with him, I went to the river where his boat was anchored. They brought a bed and placed it on the boat and covered it with a mattress and cushions from Byzantine silk brocade. Then came an old woman whom they call the Angel of Death. I saw that she was a witch, thick-bodied and sinister. The dead man did not smell bad and nothing about him had changed except his color. When they bore him into the pavilion on the boat and sat him on the mattress supported by cushions, they brought in a dog, which they cut in two and threw into the boat. Next, they took two horses and made them run, before hacking them to pieces with swords and throwing their flesh onto the boat. Then they brought two cows, which they also cut into pieces and threw them onto the boat. Finally, they brought a cock and a hen, killed them and threw them onto the boat as well. Meanwhile, the slave girl, who wanted to be killed, came and went entering in turn each of the pavilions that had been built, and the master of each pavilion had intercourse with her, saying, Tell your master that I only do this for your love of him. When the time had come for the evening prayer, they led the slave girl towards something which they had constructed and which looked like the frame of a door. 
she placed her feet on the palms of the hands of the man until she could look over this frame. She said some words and they let her down. They raised her a second time, and she did as she had the first, and then they set her down again, and a third time, and she did as she'd done the other two. I asked the interpreter what she had been doing, he replied. The first time they lifted her up, she said, I see my father and my mother. The second time she said, there I see all my dead relatives sitting. And a third time she said, There I see my master sitting in paradise, and paradise is green and beautiful, and he's calling me. Take me to him. They went off with her towards the boat. She took off the two bracelets that she was wearing and gave them both to the old woman, who is known as the angel of death. She was to kill her. The old woman seized her head made her enter the pavilion, and went in with her. The man began to bang on their shields with staves to drown her cries so that the other slave girls would not be frightened and try to avoid dying with their masters. Next, six men entered the pavilion and had sex with the girl, one after another, after which they laid her beside her master. Two seized her feet and two others her hands. The angel of death came and put a cord round her neck in such a way that the two ends went in opposite directions. She gave the ends to two of the men so they could pull on them. Then she herself approached the girl holding in her hand a dagger with a broad blade and plunged it again and again between the girl's ribs, while the two men strangled her with the cord until she was dead. Next, the closest male relative of the dead man came forward and took a piece of wood, which he lit at the fire. Thus, he set fire to the boat, after they had placed the slave girl beside her master. The fire then enveloped the wood, the boat, the man, the girl and all that there was on the boat. A violent and frightening wind began to blow, the flames grew in strength, and the heart of the fire intensified." Unquote. So there you have the only eyewitness account of a Viking ship burial. I think Ibn Fadlan's description was vivid enough, no need to expand on this. I'll just add that the archaeological evidence for these encounters is much more numerous, for example, with the discovery of Arab silver coins in various places of Scandinavia. However, did the king of the Volga Bulgars get his money? Well, we don't know because the rest of the account was lost. We know that later on, the Volga Bulgars converted to Islam, but we do not know if it was through Ibn Fadlan's embassy. It is quite strange, though, that such a magnificent empire, as described before, allowed this embassy to have such an uncertain outcome. The Caliph is giving clear signs of weakness by being unable to make the funds available for this diplomatic mission. Indeed, Ibn Fadlan captured a snapshot of a time on the verge of change. Apart the power struggles that the Caliph was facing from within, 
More and more, the August Turks that Ibn Fadlan visited in the steppe were being enrolled in the caliph's army as slave soldiers, to the point that they started to seize power themselves, and a new force emerged, the Seljuk Turks, which constituted a threat to the Byzantine Empire and to the safety of pilgrimages from Western Christendom. In Europe, the Vikings, these that were facing West, Hungarians and Slavic peoples, who were pagans, converted to Christianity around this time and were integrated in the Roman Catholic Church. But the violence inherent to these troublemakers did not just disappear by converting to Christianity. For all the mentioned reasons, the First Crusade started and amounted to the instability of the Middle East. The Rus, or the Vikings, facing east would soon convert to Orthodox Christianity, then blend with local Slavic people in today's Ukraine, around the Dnieper River, and set the common foundation of the Ukrainian, Russian and Belarusian states. The Viking ruler who converted to Orthodox Christianity was called Valdemar, which then evolved into its Slavic form, Volodymyr or Vladimir. In the Iberian Peninsula, the Reconquista was pushing the Arab influence to the African continent, and two centuries later, the Mongol invasion left quite a scar in Baghdad's splendor. It is said that the river Tigris turned black from the ink of books that were thrown into it. We enter a different world order, with its changes and continuities. I'll finish this context part with a paragraph written by Ibn Khaldun a 14th-century Arab social scientist whose book, the Muqaddima, is a must in the shelf of any historian. Quote, then, the days of Arab rule were over. The early generations who had cemented Arab might and founded the realm of the Arabs were gone. Power was seized by others, by non-Arabs like the Turks in the east, the Berbers in the west and European Christians in the north. With their passing, entire nations ceased to exist, and institutions and customs changed. Their glory was forgotten, and their power no longer heeded. Both the learned and the ignorant are able to understand this. For on the surface, history is no more than information about political events, dynasties, and occurrences of the remote past, elegantly presented and spiced with proverbs. It serves to entertain large, crowded gatherings and brings to us an understanding of human affairs. It shows how changing conditions affected society, how certain dynasties came to occupy an ever wider space in the world, and how they settled the earth, until they heard the call and their time was up." Unquote. Do you remember, dear listener, the story we left hanging on that cliff? Let's conclude it and find out why the young man unjustly killed that girl. The young man replied, You must know, commander of the faithful, that this girl was my wife. I married her when she was a virgin and God gave me three sons by her. She used to love me and I saw no fault in her while I, for my part, loved her dearly. At the beginning of this month, she felt seriously ill, but I brought her doctors and gradually she got better. I wanted to take her to the baths, but she said that before going, there was something that she wanted for which she had been longing. I asked what it was and she said, I have a longing for an apple that I can smell and from which I can take a bite. I went straight away to the city and searched for apples, but I couldn't find a single one to buy. I went back home in distress and told my wife of my failure. This upset her. She had been weak before, and at night she became much weaker. I spent the night brooding over the problem and when morning came, I left my house in search for apples, when I met a gardener who said, there are few or no apples to be found, except in Basra. I went back home and my love and affection for my wife led me to make myself ready to set out on a journey to Basra. I traveled for 15 days and nights there and back, bringing my wife three apples. I went in and gave them to her, but they gave her no pleasure and she put them aside. 
Her weakness and fever had grown worse, and this went on for ten days, after which she recovered. I then left my house and went to my shop. At midday, while I was sitting there, a black slave passed by holding one of those three apples in his hand and playing with it. When I asked him about the apple, pretending that I wanted to get one like it, he laughed and told me that he had got it from his mistress. He explained. I had been away, and when I got back I found her sick. She had three apples with her, and she told me that her cuckold of a husband had gone to Basra for them. It was one of these that I took. When I heard what the slave had to say, commander of the faithful, the world turned black for me. I got up, closed my shop, and returned home out of my mind with anger. Looking at the apples, I could see only two. Where is the third? I asked my wife. And when she said, I don't know, I was certain that the slave had told me the truth, so I picked up a knife, and coming from behind her, without a word, I knelt on her breast and slit her throat with a knife. I wrapped her in a piece of carpet, sewed the whole thing up, and put it in the chest, which I locked. I then loaded it onto my mule and threw it with my own hands into the Tigris River. Without anyone knowing what I had done, I went back home, and there I found my eldest son in tears, although he did not know what I had done to his mother. When I asked him why he was crying, he told me that he had taken one of his mother's apples and had gone into the lane to play with his brothers. He said, But a tall black slave snatched it from me and asked me where I had got it. I told him that my father had gone to Basra to bring it for my mother who was sick and that he had bought three apples. The slave took the apple, then he hit me and went off with it. I was afraid that my mother would beat me because of it. Evening came and I was still afraid of what she might do to me. For God's sake, father, don't say anything to her that may make her ill again. When I heard what the boy had to say, I realized that this slave was the one who made up a lying story to hurt my wife and I was certain that I killed her unjustly. I implore you, by your ancestor's honor, to kill me quickly, as there is no life for me now that she is dead, so avenge her death on me. When the caliph heard the young man's story, he was filled with astonishment and said, By God, I shall hang no one except this damn slave. Then he turned to Jafar and said, Fetch me this damn slave who was responsible for all this, and if you fail, you will take his place. Morning now dawned, and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the twentieth night, she continued. The slave turned out to be Jafar's slave. That's how interconnected and small this world was perceived. Thanks again for listening. If you think this show is worth a dollar or two, please find the PayPal link in the description. Don't forget to subscribe and see you the next time.